you've cleared the waiting room, but if you want to give it another minute or so, I only have three committee members in. Let's see. Elaine emailed me. She was having problems with the link. So I resent her the invite. So hopefully she'll be able to join soon. And Keisha emailed me earlier. She may or may not be able to attend. Okay, it's almost five after we might want to get started so that way we can respect everybody's time. Um, the committee members that I have logged in, I have Julie, Jordan, Patricia, and Roger. If I missed anybody, can you please let me know? My name is actually Julia with an A, not an E. Oh, my, I'm sorry about that. I wrote it down wrong. Sorry about that. Okay, if no other board members are here, we currently do not have a quorum, so we won't be able to vote for our chair or co-chair. If anyone else logs in a few minutes late, um, we can circle back to that. Leslie, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. So good afternoon. My name is Leslie Hoffman. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Medicaid Services, and I proudly serve as a Medicaid champion for racial and health equity. This is our second uh, newly established meeting of the uh, Health Disparity and Equity TAC. Um, in the last couple of months, we've received lots of feedback and positive comments and interest regarding this TAC and upcoming initiatives on both uh, federal and state level. So folks are uh, asking what we've got going on in Kentucky, so be proud. Um, what a wonderful opportunity for all of us in Kentucky to practice culture humility and to empower positive change. Very proud of us. So on behalf of the Cabinet and Health and Family Services, we would like to welcome each and one of, every one of you participating on this call today and in this meeting, a very, very warm welcome. Erin? We cannot approve minutes either since we do not have a quorum. So we're we'll too short for a quorum. So okay. if they join after the fact, I'll let you know, Leslie, and we can circle okay. the quorum. Okay, and then the approving of the minutes the same? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so then we'll go to old, old business, which this was some uh, a few requests that the committee had of Medicaid uh, from our last meeting. So I'm going to turn it over to Jody Allen, who is also a champion uh, in Medicaid for racial and health equity. Good afternoon, everyone. So good to be here with you this afternoon. I'm excited to share this health equity infographic that we've created. Um, I think that the visual representation will help you all to really see a lot more clearly all the things that we're doing in Kentucky right now towards health equity. I'm going to share my screen. Actually, if someone could um, enable screen sharing, <laughs> that would be great.
You should now be a co-host. Thank you. Okay, I'm not able to. There we go. Sorry about that. Can you see now? Okay, great. This is our um, health equity infographic. Um, thanks to Beth Fisher for helping us put this together. I thought she did a really great job. But as you can see here, um, you can see the CHFS vision, a commonwealth where every Kentuckian reaches their full human potential and all communities thrive. You can see the CHFS pillars of equity, economic support, um, resilience, and I'm having a hard time reading that one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, as far as our DMS vision, to be a diverse and inclusive organization that prom promotes equity in the delivery of healthcare services to improve the health and well being of all individuals served by the department. So you can also see here um, our equity goals of integrating equity in policies, programs, and practices, creating a diverse and inclusive workforce, hiring equity-focused vendors, and fostering understanding of equity. So um, as we mentioned briefly during the last meeting, these are our overall enterprise goals for the Racial Equity um, Action Plan across DMS. And just to show you a little bit of progress that we've made towards those goals, all DMS divisions are training on the Government Alliance on Racial Equity Tool, which we mentioned last time is an accountability tool that we can use in our decision making process um, to enhance racial equity and health equity across the board, um, creating new programs to expand postpartum coverage integrating care, enhancing mobile crisis, and expanding services for the severely mentally ill. Those are all initiatives that are ongoing right now. And create equity and determinants of health branch. So we now have a branch that will be focused on these initiatives across Medicaid as well. And a little bit more about how we have made progress towards our goals. Full implementation of the GARE tool across all divisions will take place by the end of this year, and we are on track to accomplish that goal. Divisions can track progress and input data now into a web-based technology platform. Um, so we are gathering information, and as we reach our goals in our action plan, um, we are able to record those and keep track of them um, and for best practice. Um, in June 2022, Kentucky announced expansion of postpartum coverage through Medicaid and CHIP, and an estimated 10,000 women will be impacted through a demonstration uh, for for certified community behavioral health clinics are operating around Kentucky. Um, clinics provide an array of behavioral health services and integrated primary care, um, which does increase health equity uh, for all in Kentucky. Equity and determinants of health branch will have several important areas of focus, such as assisting with the implementation of the racial and health equity action plan, among many, many other things. Also, you're getting ready to hear today um, from a group, uh, the Medicaid Innovation Collaborative, um, that we are going to be a state in this next state cohort focused on social determinants of health and equity. Um, we're really excited about this opportunity, and um, I think it will be it off the ground and running in January. We've already had some preliminary meetings and just getting organized and structured, but they're here actually today to speak a little bit more with you. Um, this cohort will be Kentucky, New York, Nevada, Iowa. So that's a new one that we need to add here um, and possibly um, North Carolina, but I'm not sure if we have official word on that yet. Maybe they can share that with us today, but we're gonna be learning so much from this group. Um, and we're really excited about all of the things that we are going to be able to accomplish um, for Kentucky and for health equity through being a part of this state cohort and learning so much more. 
DMS and sister agencies are committed to enhancing their behavioral health mobile crisis intervention system to ensure comprehensive, coordinated, easily accessible, culturally informed, and integrated services are available for all Kentuckians experiencing behavioral health crisis, regardless of ability to pay. So um, we are at the, we have finished the planning grant for the mobile crisis, um, and we are now working towards implementation of that um, program and initiative. So we're really proud of that and excited for that and how we will be able to reach Kentuckians that way as well. And then here you all are. Welcome to the Health Disparity and Equity TAC members. Um, as your partners in public service, we're excited to welcome you to Team Medicaid and to work together to make health care more equitable for all. So this is just, again, um, an infographic that we put together to help you all and just all of our members um, see the kinds of things that we're doing uh, right now in the area of health equity. So we're really excited to share that with you. I also um, wanted to touch base a little bit on the next old business item, um, which is a follow up from the Medicaid Innovation Collaborative Showcase Summaries that we sent out. So after the initial um, meeting, we were able to share with you from the Medicaid Innovation Collaborative. Again, they're here and they'll be able to speak a little bit more with you um, here in just a few minutes, but um, those both of those showcase summaries were focused on maternal behavioral health and adolescent behavioral health innovations. Um, and so I just wanted to, to mention again, if you haven't had time to take a look at those, it's really just fascinating what some of these, these states, which again, these are states that were in the first co cohort and now we're going to be in the next cohort, but you can see all the great work that was done and just the sharing um, of some of just the most innovative practices and strategies in, in behavioral health um, and just working towards health equity. Um, it's just really amazing to see. So if you haven't had a chance to review those, I would encourage you to do so. But I also wanted to just see if there were any questions, comments, or concerns about that material if you were able to review it. No questions here. Okay, thank you. And if anybody does have questions, feel free to reach out to Jody or myself or to send it to Erin and she'll ensure that we get the information back. So we'll go on to the next piece, which I'm proud that we were able to get our Medicaid, uh, our Medicaid Innovation Collaborative uh, group here today to speak to us for a few minutes. So um, I feel like this is a really good opportunity for you um, on this committee and those of you that are listening in today to hear what some of our goals are uh, working in this collaborative uh, going into this cohort that will, will last a, uh, you know, a significant amount of time where we want to go with our goals. So I will turn it over to Chris. Are you on? Yeah. Do you need a screen share? I will, yes. Okay, thank you. You should be able to screen share now. Wonderful, thank you. Um, want to first and foremost say thank you to the folks at DM, DMS, especially Leslie and Jody, who have been amazing partners thus far um, in this process and very much appreciative of the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, so want to take this opportunity to share a little bit more about the program. I know um, DMS has mentioned it before, and so if some of this is repetitive, I apologize that this is kind of our standard overview, and then we have um, a little bit of an ask towards the end of our, the presentation today. Um, but of course, this is, um, I don't want to talk at you for the amount of, of time that um, we've been allotted, so if you have questions, I encourage you to please um, jump in and ask them as I run through the slides. So just for context, um, the first thing I want to talk about today is what we mean when we say tech-enabled innovation, because um, I think this is important context to provide um, as we talk through what this program is really about. So first and foremost, when we talk about innovation, the purpose is really to address the needs or wants of a customer, um, or in this case, it could be a client, a patient, or a Medicaid member. Um, this is something that's really driven by a desire to make something better. Um, so in, in the case of MIC, as we call it, it's really about enhancing care, and this could be access to care, the quality of care, the coordination of care, all with the intent 
intention of, of in, um, producing better health outcomes. And so this could be within or outside of um, traditional systems of care. Um, it of course implies that there's something new or novel about a product or service. Um, it's really important that the product or service can sustain over time, that it has the ability to scale, um, and that it has longevity, um, both in its business model and in what it, um, the impact that it delivers. Um, it's also really important that it delivers value to that intended customer and ideally to the broader ecosystem as well. Um, and when we say tech enabled, it simply means that it harnesses an existing technology um, to deliver that product or service. So a perfect example is a smartphone app. Um, and this, in our case, we've seen um, tech enabled innovation that looks very low tech, high touch, and all the way to something that's very high tech with low touch. Um, so you can see a couple of like the traditional buzzwords that are probably more familiar for folks around the edges of the screen. So often considered to be um, called like digital health or health, health tech. And we're seeing a number of virtual or hybrid care delivery models entering the market as well. So there's a good number of tech enabled solutions or innovations that are on the market today. Um, for us, it's really about assessing the landscape to understand how tech enabled innovation can tackle the, um, the biggest challenges around health equity today. Um, so how might tech enabled solutions address social determinants of health? How might it meaningfully engage Medicaid members? Um, how might it enhance maternity care for black birthing people in the US? Um, so there are a ton of organizations that are doing this really wonderful work. Um, this is just a very small snippet of a couple of those kinds of organizations, but the market is large and growing um, on a daily basis. But I think what we find is there is still a challenge around who these solutions are typically built for. Um, so it's probably not surprising for folks here that they um, are usually targeted towards a more commercial market. So employer-based um, plans or even occasionally some Medicare Advantage. Um, but really um, it's kind of this battle of, of what we call um, sometimes called wealth tech instead of health tech. It's that if you have the money to invest in these kinds of solutions to improve outcomes um, for your member population, um, it typically skews towards that commercial population. But we actually find that um, there is immense value for these kinds of solutions in Medicaid. Um, in particular, we see that when they're built appropriately, they have the power to fill gaps within traditional systems of care um, where those systems fall short or are under-resourced. And in doing so can actually enhance that care access, that care delivery, and that care quality over time. We find it can address disparities um, typically in providing a new approach that addresses the needs and preferences of the target population they're aiming to serve. These solutions can be uh, more responsive to um, patient or client needs because of um, they're typically built to be very iterative or adaptive. And so we find that they, um, in their adaptation, can be very proactive to the needs of the populations they serve. Um, these are great tools often to connect disparate resources that exist across the ecosystem. And so um, it's often that health services and social services may not have the opportunity to connect, but these are all organizations serving the same Medicaid population. And then finally, these solutions we find because they do have a more frequent touch points with members can actually be a great point, uh, a point of interaction to collect data from folks. Um, both on physical and mental health needs over time.
But of course, there are still some challenges that exist. These are innovations that are underutilized in Medicaid. Um, we do see as a comparison that commercial populations typically have a higher uptake than Medicaid. And some of that is due to um, other systemic barriers, for instance, access to consistent access to broadband or to a smartphone. Um, but we still see there is some use, but not to the scale of that there is with other kinds of populations. And then, of course, the, the ecosystem is broad and often fragmented. Of course, we have one central federal regulator in CMS, but there's 56 state Medicaid offices. Um, across those Medicaid offices, they serve about 75 million different beneficiaries, all with very unique needs. Um, and then across all the states and within each of those departments, there's thousands of different kinds of Medicaid policies and requirements that um, the organizations need to consider if they're aiming to get into this market. And then you drill down even further and there's hundreds of different managed care organizations that are actually um, uh, providing the, the coverage and benefits for these individuals. And then, of course, we have that um, private market that has innovations emerging on a regular basis. So the, as the old adage goes, if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. Um, so lots of diversity across the country. But um, we sought to really figure out if there was a way that we could gather a partnership of individuals and organizations that could work together towards this vision of changing the way that the Medicaid system addresses health inequities. And so from that, the Medicaid Innovation Collaborative was born um, with an aim to improve the health and well-being of individuals on Medicaid by connecting the ecosystem to tech-enabled innovations, similar to the ones that uh, I showed you earlier. And so we, we do this by addressing a couple of key pillars um, within our model. So one is coordinating across the ecosystem. We think it's really important to bring all of the appropriate stakeholders to the table to make sure that everybody has an equal voice in this process. Um, it's really about aligning our cohort members around a common goal and then, of course, having that opportunity to learn and share best practices, not only across states, but across managed care plans and communities. We really want to center on the consumer voice. In this case, we actually work um, directly with beneficiaries and community representatives to understand how um, disparities are manifesting in their geographies and then integrate community members into the process to provide feedback through key phases of the program, which I'll share with you in just a moment. Um, and then we really wanna make sure that through actually sourcing these kinds of solutions that we are doing so in a way that makes the most sense for what the community actually wants or needs. And then finally, um, we believe we can enable action. So we, um, both through state technical assistance and working with the managed care organizations, we believe we have the power to um, evolve the way that the ecosystem views innovation and its potential um, to address equity concerns. We provide guidance on policy and payment um, at the state level, um, but also connect the managed care organizations back to that, those solutions that can hopefully drive change uh, in the populations they serve. And of course, all of this really, um, the goal is to create that environment that is right for um, the adoption of these kinds of innovative solutions. And so our program is built with three key phases. Um, first and foremost, we have our um, define and discover phase, which is where, again, our cohort aligns on a problem, in this case, social determinants of health for our 2023 cohort, um, and really set goals and expectations for um, the program moving forward. Then we move into our discovery phase, which again is where we actually engage directly with beneficiaries to understand their needs. What are the biggest gaps, challenges, and barriers that exist to actually accessing um, social services or um, health services within their communities? And what are the things that would enhance or improve that access over time? Next, we move into our sourcing and selection phase. Um, we actually go out with a national request for information and source um, 
a number of different kinds of solutions um, that can hopefully address the needs that we've identified through discovery. And then we actually bring all of our cohort members together, so our state, our managed care, and our community representatives to vet, evaluate, and lift up um, the top solutions that we feel can best address those needs that we've identified. We move into connection and catalyzation. So we um, set up an event to actually connect all of our cohort participants to the, those solutions identified through the selection process. And then of course we support both the state and the managed care plans in the adoption of innovations or policy that can move the needle on health equity and their target populations. Throughout all of that, we um, provide a couple of other support mechanisms. We do um, a number of different kind of um, shared collaborative sessions where there's learning opportunities across the cohort members. Um, we also provide technical assistance to our state agency partners and um, a number of other kind of deliverables that provide value to our participants. And so we just wrapped up our first cohort, which included Arizona, Hawaii, and West Virginia. That cohort opted to focus on behavioral health, and in particular, um, both adolescent and maternal behavioral health as their focuses. We were successful in recruiting 100% of their managed care plans, which um, totaled 15 plans across the three states. Uh, we engaged about over a hundred stakeholders through that discovery process. So all of that primary research that yielded the insights, which informed our request for information. We got 81 applicants across um, two different applications, one specific to adolescent and another to maternal, um, and then selected um, five solutions to present to our adolescent focuses focus area and then um, six solutions for our maternal focus area. What's really exciting is that we're seeing um, some movement towards adoption of these solutions. There are a number of the presenting companies that are now being considered for contracting. Um, and we're also seeing states um, adopting new policies or um, procedures in order to encourage their plans to adopt these tech-enabled innovations. A great example is our partners in West Virginia. Um, they are actually now including a requirement in their managed care contracts um, to use a tech-enabled solution for their adolescent population. Um, and so it's, it's now a requirement for them to include some kind of um, tech solution as part of their offerings. They're also implementing a quality withhold associated with adolescent behavioral health. Um, and so we're really excited to see what comes out of that in the next um, coming months and years. And so I want to share like a quick example. This is actually from a prior engagement um, where Access or the Arizona Medicaid um, program and their managed care plans were looking um, to address both social determinants of health and digital member engagement. And so it was a very similar process. It was a, called an um, innovation challenge back then, but the, um, they really honed in on PIX Health, which is um, tech enabled, but it is a human centered intervention for social isolation. And so the success here was that all seven of the managed care plans within Arizona actually contracted and implemented PICS. Um, and within the first six months, they actually saw a savings of over $5,000 per member and about 60% of users that showed a reduction in their loneliness. So a great example of exactly how some of these solutions can not only enhance care, but improve costs for um, the managed care plans as well as the state. And so a little bit more about MIC and who we are. So this is a program of Acumen America, which is a nonprofit impact investment firm. Um, Acumen America really is focused on systemic change. And so they see the Medicaid Innovation Collaborative as a means of furthering that goal. Um, 
And if we receive technical assistance partnership through the Center for Healthcare Strategies, which is a Medicaid focused um, leader in policy and technical assistance. And of course, we couldn't do this work um, without the generous support of our funders. Um, it's important to note here that uh, we actually provide the program to states and managed care plans and community representatives at no cost. Um, and so this is a means of providing what we believe is a really valuable service um, and adding bandwidth to state agencies that may not otherwise have the opportunity um, to do this kind of work. So like I mentioned, the focus of our 2023 cohort is around the social determinants of health. Um, we recognize that there has been considerable, considerable progress um, in the adoption of tools to um, identify needs and make referrals. Um, but we're really interested in that kind of SDOH 2.0 or what we call the last mile challenge. And so how do we actually make sure that gaps are closed and that those um, social needs are met within the population? And so in this case, we're really interested in of course, sourcing those tech-enabled solutions, but also um, new care delivery models um, that can address the opportunity to really close those gaps. Um, and so we're looking to move beyond resource directories and screening tools that are have, I think, in many cases, become a little bit more ubiquitous in um, the environment today and look at um, other kinds of Focuses. So in this case, there's a couple of examples here at the bottom of the screen for both um, food, community enablement programs, as well as transportation. And so these are just a couple of examples of the kinds of things that we would potentially be sourcing through this next cohort process. And as mentioned, we have um, Iowa, Kentucky, Nevada, and New York confirmed. You can see this is the number of managed care, um, covered managed care lives within each of the states. I think now Kentucky is actually higher, so I need to update this, but um, we're really excited to have this broad reach through the next cohort. And um, I've reached a point in the conversation where we have a little bit of a request. And I think that hopefully this is a great group that um, may understand um, you know, who within Kentucky would fit this bill. Um, so we, as part of the process, form a community advisory council. In this case, we're looking for about three to five representatives per state. Um, we're looking for folks who are or have been Medicaid beneficiaries or have the lived experiences with challenges meeting social needs um, and or are an advocate who has that direct contact with individuals um, with social determinants of health needs. Um, ideally, this is somebody who uh, has a good pulse on the most pressing social service gaps or barriers in their communities. Um, and is somebody who's comfortable speaking up and sharing their perspective in a group setting. Um, the role is that this group will provide um, key input throughout the phases of the program um, and that they would represent the community interest throughout the project. Um, really, we're looking for um, feedback around not, um, our research insights, but also our research process, because we're just getting that um, kicked off here this month um, around that uh, innovation sourcing and evaluation. So actually getting um, folks to review applications and provide their perspective on which of the solutions feel like they would be the best fit in those in um, their communities, and then could support actually feedback directly back to the managed care plans or to DMS um, in terms of what they feel are the solutions that are the best fit. So we anticipate this time commitment would be about an hour um, and a half per month um, that could um, ebb and flow a little bit depending on the time in the program. It's important to note here that this is um, a paid position, so we would provide a monthly um, honorarium to the individuals participating in the Community Advisory Council, um, up to about $900 over the course of the program. And so if you know someone who would be a good fit, we would love to talk with them. Um, 
you can email me at um, carissa at medicaidcollaborative.org. As soon as I stop my screen share, I'll also put that my email in the chat for um, folks. And then of course, um, Leslie and Jody also know how to get a hold of me. So um, if you don't capture my contact information um, today, they, they know where to find me. Um, so I will take a moment and pause for questions. And if I missed some in the chat, I apologize. Um, but I'll leave this up on the screen. Carissa, if I drop my email in the chat, could you please send that to me so I can share your presentation with the TAC members? Of course, yeah, okay. happy to. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we also have a quorum. Oh, okay. So just real quick for Clarissa's comments uh, about um, working with her uh, in this in this type of collaborative um, and really empowering uh, Kentucky to be a part of decisions that are being made. Right. Um, uh, we know that you probably need time, but this is something that we could probably utilize the committee um, that they can uh, take a look at uh, these local partners that might be good representatives um, to be on uh, this committee uh, on this uh, council. So um, I don't think Clarice, so I don't or don't expect anybody to answer today, but um, I think we can have that as a take back or recommendation for the committee to take a look at between maybe now and our, our next meeting. Meeting, and if we have any questions, we can reach back out to you. Is that okay? Yep, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you do have folks in mind and you want to pass my email along directly to them, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, or if you you want to be kind of um, the conduit to making a connection, happy to happy to set up a conversation in whatever way people prefer. Sure. Okay. So, Aaron, I think we'll go back if that's okay. Um, if we're finished, Clarissa. Um, We'll go back to um, establishing the quorum, Erin. Yes, let me pull up my screen here so the agenda is ready. So um, first, I, just a friendly reminder that all of our committee members, when we're establishing our quorum, you've got to have your video on. So if you're not on the committee, if you could turn your video off, and if you are on the committee, if you could turn your video on, please. And I'm going to do a quick roll, roll call, excuse me, of the members that I have logged in. I have Julia. Yes. Jordan. Present. Katrina. Oh, I thought I saw her logged in a minute ago. I'm here. There we go. Oh, there you are. I see you. <laughs> Patricia. Here. Elaine. I am here. Okay. And Roger. Here. Okay. Thank you guys. So we have established a quorum. So the first order of business is um, I had sent out an email and asked if anyone was interested in being the chair or co-chair and I didn't get a response. I'm going to guys put you guys on the hot seat now. So if anyone um, would like to volunteer for either one of those positions or nominate one of your fellow committee members, just let me know and we could do a vote. Um, your chair and co-chair work together to um, set your agendas and keep everything moving. And they will also run the meetings moving forward. So if anyone is interested in being uh, the chair, you can nominate yourself or someone else now. This is Julia. I nominate anyone but me. <laughs> um, but if you, I, in so the reason why uh, I've chaired a TAC before, and the trouble that I had, all of my time was taken up in the admin work, making sure people showed up, making sure we got quorum. I didn't get to do any of the work, like the stuff I wanted to do. So that's why. Um, I guess I'm speaking up to see what what role is the chair responsible for making sure everybody gets here and you know that there was a lot of admin work when I chaired a TAC before um, and so I'm not interested in that because I really want to do the work work instead of the admin work. In our other TACs that we run um, typically what the chair does and the co-chairs they will send an email out with the draft agenda and ask others to contribute to the agenda. 
Um, I will be, I am technically responsible for kind of spearheading the meeting and I make sure that you guys have a quorum as you guys log in, um, that's kind of take role. And so I take part of that responsibility. So really it's just getting your agenda prepped and to me. And then I get it uploaded. I get the invites out to um, everything. I share the agendas with our staff at DMS and I also share it with the MCOs. Yeah, and then it's, it, this is Veronica, Judy Cecil with Medicaid. It, the only other piece to that is, um, you know, running the meeting. So calling for motions and um, recommendations. Um, but we, I, I wanted, I did want to add um, for anybody willing to to step up that we, we will absolutely support you. Um, you know, this, uh, we, we understand what you're saying, Dr. Richardson, and that's, I think um, you all, again, have your day-to-day uh, lives and work. Um, and we appreciate that you're volunteering to be a part of this group. So we don't want to make it burdensome. Uh, so we will, we will provide as much support as we possibly can to, to make it successful. But we do have to have a chair. <laughs> so. And can we nominate? I, I want to nominate Dr. Cleveland. Can I do that? <laughs> but I don't want to be dominated. <laughs> if, he's, if he's welcome to accept the nomination. Um, and so the other thing we can do is uh, if there is just one nomination and the person is willing uh, to accept the nomination, then we can just uh, call for a, a vote um, among the members, you know, um, um, we can, you all can uh, vote by acceptance. I would second the nomination, but Dr. Cleveland would probably kill me. That is, that is true, Elaine and Katrina. I, um, this is like maybe five advisor groups I'm on right now, not counting the ones I serve on campus. So I would love to, but I probably wouldn't do any justice because I'm, I'm extremely busy, like all of us are. But I think Katrina could probably handle it though. Sounds I said good to me. Don't throw it back. No, I, I can't. I'm I on so many committees. I, I will fully support the chair and the vice. Well, Dr. Julie, she threw her, she threw it out there. Dr. Julia, they said they would do the uh, all the leg work, so I nominate her. I'm just nominating now, people. So how many of us are there? Are there how many people on the committee? Why don't we each take it for two months? There are 10 of you. Uh, we have four members missing today. So we each take it for two months and that gets us through two years. Um, you know, we'll have to take that proposal back um, to see how that fits with the uh, executive order in the um, uh, it's a very appreciate the innovative idea. <laughs> um, uh, so if you all, uh, we want to table it, which I just really don't want to do, but um, if there's nobody who's uh, stepping up today, uh, you know, we can take that back and, and see if that's a, a potential um, option. Is anyone, Jordan, would you be willing to do it just like for the first three months? Um, I was actually going to ask, like, I imagine the person would need to be here to be nominated or no. I was looking through the minutes last time and, and Dr. Uh, I don't want to say her name wrong, but I think uh, Figaro maybe, um, you know, seemed like uh, she at least had some decent insight and, and maybe more knowledgeable. Um, and then obviously Dr. Richardson as well uh, spoke up and, and had some questions and things like that. So I was just trying to kind of look through and see who maybe uh, had contributed a lot and may, may be able to help guide us as, as the chair. And so those were two names that I had saw. Dr. Richardson already spoke up and said, you know, maybe not ideally wanting to do that, but um, I didn't know if Dr. Vergara would, but she's not here to kind of answer that question. That helps. I have an agenda template that most of the tax follow. It's pretty 
I mean, it, it looks very similar to this one. Um, you know, as your meetings grow, of course, your agenda will likely grow. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> And I already asked Dr. Batista to do it, and I think she's she already declined. But now you could jump in. If you go as a chair, I'll support you. I'll, I'll do my best. Only for purposes of moving forward, I will do it for three months. But that means somebody else has to do it next. Well, let's, so let's take that. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, then we will, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we will call for a vote um, and we can do it by, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the word. Um, if if uh, the, the members could just open their mic and we'll call for a vote of uh, Dr. Richardson as chair. Um, if, I, I, if you I agree to to I'm sorry? I will co-chair with her. Oh, thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, so Dr. Richardson as chair, Doc, uh, Mrs. Bautista as um, co-chair, and um, if you agree, signify by saying aye. Aye. Are, are aye. Uh, any nays? Okay, well, for three then months. We will... for three months, we're all going to take turns. <laughs> we will move forward with that approach. Um, uh, and again, we'll work on the logistics of that. Um, uh, we'll take that off, um, a one off uh, from the meeting today. Um, and Dr. Richardson, would, would you mind calling for a motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting? Uh, is there a motion for approval of the minutes? So moved. Roger moved. Katrina, is it Katrina? Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Second. Seconded. Any further discussion on the minutes? All those in um, agreement say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. All right. Thank um, you. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, well, let's see. I'll, I think yeah, I'll just go. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take back over. So, under new business number six, we uh, our second item on the agenda is committee goals, and we have Vivian Lastly Bibbs from the Department of Public Health on. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I think the objective today was to try to think of of what you heard and and how we can maybe establish some high level goals um, that we wanted to kind of address. Um, uh, as we move forward. So we know that there's some, some data gap. We, we saw the data, we know, well, at least you saw the, the health department's data uh, as it relates to some disparity gaps. Um, I'm not sure if Medicaid has done their own data mining and looking at where those gaps are and uh, from the data perspective. And then we know that there's some, also some social determinants of health issues with access, transportation and being able to connect folks to resources and how might we connect those? And I think that's what the collaborative is working on with, with, with what I've heard is to, is to recommendations moving forward. And then one of the questions might be, do we want to work this work to um, match the work that's going on with the collaborative so that they, we're all on the same page and that they're working in tandem? So I think there's a couple of questions that we have there. And, and maybe I wanna hear from you guys as, as to what you've seen presented today what might be some of those goals are that we set as those high level goals, and then maybe get into some some um, objectives and then strategies to and activities to achieve those. So if we can, do I have any comments or feedback from what you've heard today as to what you might want to put as maybe one or two goals that we start with? Um, I don't want to take over the conversation. This is the TAC, our committee. So I want to give people a chance to, to chime in so I'm just facilitating this discussion. <laughs> Please don't give me silence. <laughs> I was <laughs> going to. Please don't. <laughs> we would love a menu, Vivian, like what you think from your expertise that we might look at and then prioritize. So, you know, we know there are data gaps, but are there areas that we should prioritize? You know, maybe. Um, 
So, you know, just to give us some more concrete guidance, maybe. So I'm going to defer to Leslie and Veronica for that um, as to where they've identified the gaps, and then I can tell you where I see some of the gaps are. So, so Vivian, we've talked about um, DMS versus or Medicaid versus DBH and your public health a lot, and we seem very similar. When we hear your report outs to our report outs, Jody and I have noticed that we sound very similar in what we're trying to um, go forward with, right? The social determinants of health, racial and health equity. And of course, uh, I think we're at almost 1.7. I think it's 1.69 million now uh, in our population. Our data looks very much like yours, probably. Um, we know we have some gaps that need to be identified um, and we need a community presence and we need folks working together from boots on the ground from boots on the ground to this committee and all of our sister agencies working together, which the collaborative is one of our main goals for, uh, for, for Medicaid to reach. But we want everybody to be able to utilize and be involved in the collaborative if they uh, decide to do so. Veronica, do you have anything else to, to mention right now as far as where we are? Boom spot. Well, while she's thinking, yeah. um, we can go back to, to some of the, the things that rise to our data in DPH. One is truly the infant mortality, the infant, uh, mom, mom and baby um, mortality and morbidity rates. Um, that's one of the things that DPH is really focusing on is closing that disparity gap between mm -hmm. our black and white moms. Um, the other thing that I was hearing was util the utilization of services. Whether and that be access and transportation and availability of those services, and uh, folks being able to um, to not only find them, okay, and become aware of them, but actually be a part and be able to get there to be a part, uh, take part in those services. So those are things that we look at too, and we're also looking at um, those other um, priorities that these communities have that uh, take precedence in their daily lives: housing employment, all yes. the other things that we know impact health and health outcomes. So um, I think we need to decide, are we working on some of those upstream things that impact health? Or are we stuck in the middle looking at social determinants where we've been a while? Or are we just looking at how to improve um, and close data gaps? And I think they're all linked, but I think we need to decide yes. where we need to focus. I, I think we're, we're at the same spot as you are and also, um, we um, we are trying to start. So we've got a lot of things that are running simultaneously of what you just said, social determinants, uh, projects, policies, using the GARE tool to look through the lens to ensure that we're, you know, meeting all the expectations that we need to. And um, and and, um, you know, even um, uh, our uh, our date is December the 31st for all of our divisions to ensure that they've had some work related to the GARE tool so and some practice with it. So we're and just some basic language. Um, Jody and I have talked about this before, just just knowledge about basic language. Um, and uh, of, of course, the need for the data is there, but what can we do right now until we get there with the data, right? So we, Jody and I have been working on lots of social determinants of health here lately, working with CMS, and that spurred some of the conversations of how proud uh, we've been that that um, in the state and federal levels, they've like this is wonderful. You've, you know, you've now have a tack um, and and they're making decisions with you. What wonderful opportunity and the collaborative that will uh, get us down to a community level, right? We want everybody involved that we can. So um, if if nobody has, Vivian, anything uh, for you today? Well, I, sorry. Two more things, two more things I wanted to say. Two more things. Oh, oh so yes, I'm sorry. Two more things I wanted to just add. Um, one of them was, I hope we don't do the downstream approach for this group. I hope we do at least do some of those social determinants of health and then the sure. root, some of those root causes. I think, I, I guess my question oh. is to this group, have we done an environmental scan to our Medicaid recipients and expanded Medicaid recipients for them to identify what their needs are currently? Um, looking through a different lens maybe than we have before, using that racial equity lens and the gear tool, some of that some of the questions that that tool asked us. Um, I don't, I'm not sure we have that information. I think we're making assumptions based on what we 
has looked at versus what our clients and stakeholders need to tell us. So I pose that um, as well as looking at maybe what policies currently might be impacting some of this work or not that's impacting us to not be able to do it or to not do it in the way it needs to be done. So um, Katrina, I'm sorry, did you have something to say? I saw you kind of blink in and then I went away. Did you want to contribute? Yes, um, one thing that we're hearing a lot about is just access uh, to mental health services, especially, you know, as we are talking about um, from an equitable standpoint, you know, really just being able to access them, um, you know, just parents with young children and just the stresses that, you know, that are brought on by what we've already talked about with the social determinants of health has really just exasperated the need for mental health services and people just aren't able to to get it. And so how can we, one, you know, let people know how to access it and two, if there are policies and procedures that are preventing it from being streamlined, how can we begin to look at that and address that so people can get those services? I think we can formulate that into a goal. I think you just did. <laughs> Not even knowing you did, but I think you just did. It's to really look at, at our mental health services and, and the access and what and what are those barriers and challenges currently that are preventing folks from access of access and those resources. Um, asking them not us ascending. So asking them what are some of those barriers and challenges. How do people feel about that? I thought that was great. Some of the data that we that we've seen here in Northern Kentucky, um, I think it was less than two percent of people of color um, that have had a that have had a diagnosed disability are actually receiving any not disability but a diagnosed. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not a doctor. I forgot the right word, but yeah. <laughs> diagnoses. Uh, yeah. yeah, are are not only less than two percent are receiving any type of treatment. And so, you know, it's just very concerning to know that people have been identified and they are not able to access the treatment that they need. So is this just your, is this just Northern Kentucky data, Katrina, or is this statewide data you just did? It was Northern Kentucky data. Do we have a, do we have a statewide number for black and brown communities receiving mental health services in the state? Jody, do you know if Angela has that information where we have just recently been working on it? We can make that a smart, a smart ego. Yes, I think that that would be, it would be great to definitely look into that further. I know that it's been challenging to acquire specific data. Yeah, for yes. sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah. We've just recently been looking at the homeless population as well and trying to match up some of that data for the first time ever. So that's been wonderful. And this just came up this morning about how we might be able to um, get some statistical data broken out related to to racial, racial and health equity. So but Katrina, I would definitely, I mean, I am a clinician and by practice and I would say I'm in a rural area of Kentucky, but I would, I would definitely, um, definitely agree that the access to services right now is a, is a huge issue. And we're seeing that across the state, but we're seeing that nationally. And we're just really in a crisis, honestly, with mental health pr provision. So that, that sounds like a, a goal that we can turn in that we can make smarty by getting some additional information. Sure. Not what Katrina has shared, but I think that's one that we can put down. If I may add to the goals for the committee, um, JCPS uh, has, you know, shared with the uh, Immunization Advocacy Committee for the Board of Health um, in Louisville that the gap between you know, schools according to the place where they are located, uh, not only with immunization, but with so many um, routes, um, um, it just went out my head. But you know, it's not only um, working with the causes for all these disparities, but also we need to, I think, address vaccination, not only for kids, but also for adults at the same committee, adult um, medicine doctors share, even those that have received or are receiving Medicare Part B coverage, 
the access for them to some of the preventive vaccines, it's almost impossible because one shingles vaccine is $160 and it's not covered by the insurance. So there are so many things and, and I'm just speaking about vaccination upstream, but um, root causes of, of uh, disease are uh, so many. So I would just um, um, add vaccination, not only for pediatric, but also for adults. Okay. So you want to increase access or increase those those um, immunization rates, which one, both? Uh, in both, um, you know, for JCPS, um, out of all the kids that um, have uh, Medicaid coverage, I think um, the medical director for JCPS said that it was only, oh, I, I don't remember, it's thousands of kids and it's the providers that um, give vaccination. Um, I'm gonna check, I'll double check that number and I'll give it to you because it, it it's hard to believe that that is happening in the city and, and I can imagine what's happening in rural areas where, you know, being a um, vaccine provider, it's it's even harder. Okay, so that sounds like a second goal. And we can have more than one, we can, and we can have multiple ones and then we prioritize based on the information that we have and where we think we can make it definitely tangible, uh, short wins and, and improvements that would be versus some long-term wins. So. We can definitely add that. Thank you, um, Patricia, as a, as a second goal. These are great. We might have a third area maybe that we can add. I don't know that this would rise to uh, the level of a goal, but, but something around um, how do we as um, a group learn how to process information more effectively. So when people in communities are telling us their problems, that there are problems, that we have a mechanism to hear them, to process that information and to act more effectively. So I think, I think Medicaid um, staff and, and the program knows about problems. Um, community people, those of us working in the community try to reach out, say to one MCO or another MCO, like, it's hard to, it's hard to, the communication flow to effectively address problems is fragmented. Okay. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying about the communication piece. I guess my question is, how is this information relayed in some type of an of a, of a, of a, um, electronic system? So if we know that people are having these issues and we hear them both from the provider side and then from the the MCO side and then Medicaid, how are we documenting the, that conversation that has taken place or that knowledge gain? How's that being captured currently? Because if we aren't, that sounds like we need to be, and it needs to be, it needs to have a process of getting that communicated up to, up to the necessary folks to make an, a, the difference, right? To address the issue. So yeah. If I'm not hearing um, anything, Leslie, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Plus, if I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, I was going to say, um, of course, we have multiple uh, tacks, right, that we work with on a regular basis, right. and they make recommendations and bring problems to us. And some may be connected to this tack as well, right? And so then we have several mailboxes that we receive, depending on what area of Medicaid they need to go to. But we've got several areas that CHFS listens and different mailboxes that will uh, send requests or problems that folks might be having. And then we can, you know, roll out an answer uh, and, and log those. Um, on behavioral health side, we receive, um, we have one called the DMS issues box that we receive any questions related to um, behavioral health questions. I mean, maybe that's something too, uh, Vivian, that we want to look at, like how, how, if folks do have a problem, uh, what's the email address, the email box, the contact person, like something basic just to get started, right? So if Dr. Richardson identifies something uh, in the community and she wants to know who to contact, that we've got uh, maybe some basic contact information set up. Even at the MCOs, we could help with that as well. Get some, I, um, I see one or two of the MCOs today, we could on with us today, we could probably come up with some basic contact information 
that's I, I was going to throw in that a lot of tax will um, add those issues to their agenda. Mm -hmm. um, the MCOs are always here and um, they can be prepared to help answer some of those things and help guide you guys to the appropriate place um, to where if you have questions or issues with the MCOs, um, you also as a TAC have the right to ask them to present um, data if you have questions, concerns about some of their members, um, trends that they're seeing. And so as a TAC, you can also request that the MCOs Usually with six of them, we try to break them up over a couple months to give them a little time to speak. But that's also something that um, as a TAC that you guys can bring those issues to these meetings um, where we're all here as a whole and can help get those answers for you. Obvi if, <clears throat> excuse me. Of course, if there's an urgent matter, you're always welcome to reach out. Um, you can email me and I can send those to the appropriate place and help point you in the right direction of who the best person to contact would be. Great. And I'm thinking more of people that don't even know that there is an assistant hierarchy in Medicaid. I'm talking about, you know, a new pediatrician just started practice like they don't even know anything, but they've identified a really important health equity issue. For example, nutritional anemia. There's an epidemic right now. Right. We know food security is horrible. These kids, their hemoglobins are horrible. Ferencol, which is what's covered by Medicaid, is unpalatable. None of us would take it because it tastes so bad. But the Nova Ferrum, which is a few dollars more, we can't get. So we've seen where we've got kids with chronic nutritional anemia with um, even with a PA, we can't get Nova Ferrum. So that's the type of an example. And, and I was going to bring that up later, but that's like an, a specific example of there's a problem. <laughs> kids are suffering and it's a, it's, you're not getting that information. Medicaid isn't, you know, I'm advocating. I'm like, I've done, I've called 10 different people. Like I know who to call and I can't even give it the change mm -hmm. uh, made. So thinking about from a sort of rethinking the way that communication happens for people working directly with families and adults and children in the community. So that if they identify something, they have a place they know that they can reach out. Um, and it may be too big of a question, but I think I think we have mechanisms in place that aren't um, capturing some of this really valuable input. Yeah. Andy, do you have your hand raised? Yeah, and I saw uh, Dr. Cleveland and Justin as well. So we'll have, we've got a lot of folks to catch with. Go, go, go ahead, Angie. Hi, uh, this is Angie Parker. I'm the Director of Quality and Population Health with Medicaid. And this tech began a little bit after the fact that we just completed our quality strategy for Medicaid. And it does address social determinants and health disparities within that. And so I plan on giving this to uh, Aaron to uh, provide a copy of this because this is getting ready to go to CMS for your review. Um, we did have tech, uh, other techs that contributed to uh, this quality strategy. So I think it'd be good for you all to see this as well. And it could potentially help uh, with developing committee goals. I'd also like to say with the managed care companies that and through our quality um, group at uh, or division within Medicaid that we've done, we've worked, we've done what we call a, a focus study on social determinants of health that can be shared with this group as well. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, as Deputy Commissioner Hoffman, a lot of reports out there and, you know, we try not to boil the ocean and try to get down to where we need to focus, but we we do know that there's a lot to be focused on and how, how do we get there. As uh, in the presentation that Jody gave earlier, we did hire a equity and determinants of health branch manager who started today, so I'm not going to put her on the spot and introduce her today. So she is but she is listening in on this meeting. Um, and I am happy to say, you know, that she's very excited to work with you all and us and how we can best um, work through this, the health rate, health and racial equity of the um, of this tag. So any questions? So um, Angie, if we do, I'm gonna come back if they do. So I wanna make sure that Justin gets an opportunity and Dr. Cleveland, if he has something to say. So either one of those two gentlemen can, 
Yeah, hi, this is Justin Derringer. Um, I'm with the uh, Division of Healthcare Policy here at the Department for Medicaid Services. And I just wanted to let you all know that um, the CHFS Listens is a, a, a very good springboard uh, to be able to get um, individuals in the field that may not, like you said, they may not know somebody in Medicaid. They may not know exactly who to talk to or who to listen to, uh, but that's a good platform to be able to uh, send any questions or issues or suggestions to a varied group of individuals. That uh, suggestion box and 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 question um, email is actually regulated by a group of individuals that ensures uh, that those uh, questions are answered by uh, individuals in the in the right expert fields. They make sure that they're answered within a certain time frame. Uh, and there, yeah, I see it in the uh, chat. Those uh, answers are logged, and and so there you can look back on them. I know we have an individual in our division. We get a lot of those every day. We have an individual in our division, and that's part of their uh, primary responsibility is to uh, you know administer those, get those to uh, the proper individuals who can who can answer those questions, make sure they're answered in a timely fashion, log those to see uh, so that we have a record of what they were about and how they got answered and if they got answered correctly. Um, and then we also have a, an employee who just started uh, part of their new job responsibilities are uh, taking uh, all of those issues that, that may have um, an equity uh, portion of it, uh, logging those and sending those on to, to Angie's division and, uh, and, and the other individuals in the department. And uh, so th those are, so, that's a very good option, like you said, for people that are just out in the, um, in the field, uh, normal, uh, everyday individuals, they, they may be providers, or there may just be individuals who are uh, receiving services, they're having issues, whatever the case may be, uh, that's a good tool for them to be able to get their voices heard, make sure they get an answer uh, from a qualified professional, and, and that information is, is getting logged so that we can keep up with that and coordinate that and make changes accordingly. Thanks, Jeff. Roger, still on. Did you have something, Roger, you wanted to add? I was going to just echo what uh, Julia was talking about earlier about communication. I thought that's really important. Uh, I don't know how we turn that into a goal, but uh, vertical and our horizontal communication is critical to access. And so is it something to consider? And then if we do get that in place, how do we measure it? So I just wanted to kind of echo what she was saying earlier. Thanks. So I do think there's a way to turn it into a goal. Maybe we put that in a, on a post-it in our, in our, on our sidebar and work and think about how we can turn that into a goal. Because I think a number of issues have been raised. Um, one of those is the you know, communication between providers, communication and, and, and state government and, and all of those other folks that are playing a role in this and how all of those dots are connected, even though I heard them all. Uh, and they're all great things. I still think there's a disconnect in the, how they all play and relate to each other and when and and when and how you do each of those. Um, I think we have things in place. I just don't think we all know how um, how to put a um, put that matrix together to, or or organizational chart, so to speak, because you all know I'm a boxes and, and square and numbers person, how to make all that flow. So I think we can think about that as to what that might look like and maybe present that at the next meeting since that's such a critical issue. And I, I do believe it is um, because if you don't know about something, then you don't know how to address your particular issue, right? You don't know how to, how to handle that if it's known, but you don't know what resource to go to or how to connect the dots for that, for that individual. So I think we do need to, to list that one. I think there's been a lot of good discussion around it. Um, so we have potentially three committee goals to start with. Is there something else we think is equally important? One thing I think so to add to the communication is um, just being conscious about creating a friendly environment. You know, I think we hear a lot of times, um, you know, the environments that people go into are not friendly or they don't feel welcome. So, you know, how does that tie, maybe, you know, tying that into that communication piece? Because if you don't feel welcomed, you're not going to go back. Um, and I, you know, I think we see that, and we've heard that, uh, in particular from people of color that they've gone and, and just didn't feel welcomed, particularly here. And I can only speak about where I am in this region. 
But I think I'm sure, you know, if we saw data, we'll, it probably would reflect that same thing. So I, I think maybe that's included in education. I agree. I, I do think there's some opportunity for training there too for training. I think, you know, there's there's ways to interact with, with if you're a frontline person, there's a way to act as a customer service representative and how you're supposed to, you know, um, be engaging and inviting and make people feel comfortable. I think that's a low hanging fruit in the short term win that we can put down as a goal as well. Something that I think we all need to do. And we all, in, in all of our respective organizations and the representation in this task, I think that's something that we all need to be mindful of. And I agree with Katrina. Sometimes we can, um, our agencies cannot be very lucky. So um, I think that was a good point. Anything else? In the last meeting, one of the slides mentioned like uh, a biennial on odd years of minority status health report. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to look back. I seen the one from 2017. I didn't. I couldn't find like a more recent one. I'm sure it's somewhere. I just. It's good. It, it is. It's in the secretary's office for final review. Nope. <laughs> for final so, review. Because <laughs> uh, I was just trying to, you know, look at some data and see if there's. Can we look back over, you know, the past few years, because health outcomes are immediate, you know, they lag and see if there's any, um, are there areas that we are seeing uh, changes that were made that did result in equity improvement, you know, or better equity outcomes and, and try to figure out what those policies were that were implemented to see how they could potentially be applied to other areas that we don't see those types of changes or we see uh, you know, uh, a widening of the gap and how to kind of address those things. But um, yeah, because I couldn't find the more recent reports, I wasn't kind of able to, so even, to look at trends as much. So even in the, Jordan, I will say, even in the most recent report, there hasn't been much policy oh. movement toward closing, so to addressing health inequity. Um, recommendations are, are made, but um, some of those are policy recommendations, some are other things. Um, and we haven't seen a lot of traction. We're hoping that we're going to see more traction. We since the pandemic, um, we've been getting and we've been um, invited to sit at the table um, of some folks that we haven't been invited to sit at their table before. So we're hoping to get some movement and traction in the policy realm around addressing equity. So stay tuned for that. I wish I had a better answer for you. No, that's uh, fine. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, no. Another question I had, though, um, I know like these certified community behavioral health clinics, and, and it was mentioned earlier as well that there's four locations now. Um, is there like, will there be like a central hub? I, I anticipate that it's going to expand more locations and things. Is there like a way that like as providers that, that there would be a way for them to know where those locations are that are close that people could access them? Because um, I was just trying to find locations and I think maybe pathways and Ashland is like a at least it says it's a CCHBC mm -hmm. um, or BHC but I just didn't know if there was if there's the end goal is to have them somehow tied together so people actually know where those locations uh, are to, to, to hopefully you know improve access for other people um, sure. in different areas but they have to know where they are first. Yeah and we can provide um, I've spoken about the CCBHC initiative and in, in several meetings just recently and I can provide probably some visuals that'll probably help too about understanding that particular demonstration. It's a, a eight quarters. It started in January and then after the demonstration period um, we can look to expand but the original application was applied for the Department of Behavioral Health in 2016 I believe and we did not get awarded until 2020 after they reconciled money had left over Kentucky and Michigan. Oh or the next two in line and we had the opportunity to move forward. They told us that we had to use the existing application, which was for, just so happened to be for CMHCs who also are gonna now be a provider type 16 CCBHC. But this is the first real initiative that I saw that was totally integrated healthcare, 
um, you know, kind of a one-stop shop, once you're comfortable, um, serves everybody, no, no matter, regardless of payer source, um, and had some very distinct uh, populations, like we, to look at the elderly, LGBTQ, the veterans, the veterans was the one of the first ones I really noticed that this had a specific component. Now, remember, this was written in, tw in 2014, I think, is when the opportunity first came out, so it's a little bit behind times, but after we get through the demonstration, Demonstration, of course, then we can we can go forward with a, an expansion. So the, again, the, there's eight demo quarters, and it started in January. So we'll go to uh, December of 2023, I believe, and then we'll uh, somewhere along the line decide how we're going to initiate and go forth further with that, whether it be a state plan or however we decide to move forward. So yeah, it's really just got uh, got off the ground and and moving, yeah. and it's a very good initiative. Jordan, anything else? Any other questions? Thank you for those. Anybody else have any comments or questions before we move on? I'm glad we have some goals. It's been a good discussion. I think we're still learning about what resources are out there and what all of us are doing in our respective roles and how we all connect. So um, I think this is good. This is a good start. I'm sure we'll be tweaking these and we'll refining these and maybe eliminating some, eliminating something and adding something else. So it's for us to kind of chew on and think about um, what we want to do moving forward. And I think we need to keep policy on the radar as Jordan has kind of raised our, our um, antennas to that. You know, what policies do we have in place currently? Have we looked at those? I know we're looking at them through the health equity work that we're doing within the cabinet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something, um, Leslie, we can share at the next meeting is this what mm -hmm. some of those um, action items are in the community of practice for team. Mm -hmm. the racial equity work at CHFS, I think that might be helpful. Um, just a suggestion. Yeah, um, and we're, we're doing the same thing, Vivian. We're uh, just recently added required language into contracts. Um, if there's an RFP, we've been adding language there, SOWs, um, policies. Um, CMS programs that we're held accountable to, and maybe those are brand new ones we're, that we're just bringing on board. So each division within Medicaid is looking at their own policies too, and that's part of their own goals. Where can I make that change, and when can I make that change? If it needs to be an amendment or a modification, and if it, you know those kind of things. So um, I, I think so far because we've been involved with a lot of initiatives that are going on. Jody and I have been. We've been plugging those in as as Angie uh, Parker mentioned earlier. I was part of that strategic plan so we got the racial and health equity requirements and goals going forward uh, uh, put into that strategic plan so that was a really good thing. Um, one good comment that that um, I received via text here is that the MCOs all do something very similar related to social determinants of health and a lot of them do this and they're value added. It's not necessarily a requirement. They do that as an MCO and they're value added. But in the future, we might want to have, again, I'm just thinking of things that we can do for this TAC. We might want to have some MCOs to come and present based on their initiatives uh, as uh, individual MCOs. They won't be exact, but they're very similar. And what I found when I was working with the social determinants of health. Vivian, I had one other. Should we have a placeholder goal just around data? Like, I think we just need a, a data goal, like know our data or what is our data? <laughs> yeah, I, I do think we need to kind of really look at where those data gaps are again and just kind of seeing what we have and what we don't have and what we would like to capture maybe in the future that we don't capture. Um, and how we report that out. Um, we don't really look, we don't really capture to me, um, and this was with my personal opinion from our side of the house, anything related to the social determinants of health um, as to when we capture information on an on on individual. So I think that's something we need to think about as well. I would put a place, I'd put a pin in it for sure. Anything else? If not, I'm going to turn it over to Julie and Dr. Richardson for general discussion. Mm -hmm. If that's okay. That's yes, that, that's next. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Great. So I had sent in just a, you know, a list of things that were on my mind, but I don't have to go first if we want to go around and if anybody else wants to bring up any things that they've had on their mind that they want, might want to 
might have wanted to bring up today. Anybody have anything? Well, I'll kick it off and then just interrupt or we can take turns. So um, the first thing I wanted to bring up, and I think these are all questions maybe that we'll just ask for discussion or response for the next meeting. Um, so um, mentioning sort of what Dr. Bautista had mentioned around vaccines, we know there are many barriers. Well, One of the barriers is the fee schedule for um, providers that don't use the vaccines for children program. The fee schedule hasn't been updated for many years, and so um, pediatricians and family medicine and, and other offices will not administer a vaccine and lose uh, money. So, um, so this is a, a request to um, have a review of the vaccine fee schedule and, and plans to update it. I know the intention several years ago was to maintain it with up-to-date um, up um, costs. So I think that's probably just an oversight that's gotten lost in the last couple of years. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is um, community health workers. We know how vital their work is in working on equity. And I just would like to have us play a role in those conversations that are going on right now since the legislation has passed. Um, and just maybe just have that on a, a regular agenda or let us know how we can have a contribution into those conversations. Along the same line is doulas. So another evidence-based practice that we know many states have taken on as Medicaid programs per se and, and paying, um, I think most states are using state plan amendments for that, but um, having that as a more thorough discussion. I mentioned last time around um, um, caries, um, specifically in children. I know it's a problem in adults as well, but I work with children, so that's what I speak about. Um, we reached out to some local dentists here around um, taking children to the operating room to take care of rampant caries, um, and there were month delays. Used, you know, two years ago there might be a two month delay, and there were five to six month delays in getting children to the OR. When I reached out and spoke with the pediatric dentist, um, they said, we will take them. It's not a payment issue on our site. The ORs, um, the community-based ORs, so the surgical centers, the payment rates for both the, um, the time for the building as well as anesthesia, they say are, it's too low for them to block off enough spots for the dentist to have enough spots to see all the children. So for example, they may only give a pediatric dentist six spots for the month because the faster surgeries that they can turn over more quickly, they um, provide um, more surgical um, appointments for those. So the CPT codes are 41899 and 00170. That's the, what I understand to be the center code and then the anesthesia code. So um, I am hearing directly from dentists who would take kids and treat them, but they can't because the ORs will not give them time, the outpatient surgical centers. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want some information on opportunities to look at those fees. Um, two more things. <laughs> um, one is that going to the MCOs, um, I can only speak to my experience in working with the families I work with. So I work with um, all Medicaid, um, all of my patients have Medicaid unless they're uninsured. Um, so I work with all five MCOs and I, I'd like to talk more at some point about the incentive programs that they offer, the member benefits. The families I work, work with cannot access those. They are, most of the families don't speak English or if they speak English, they don't read English. Navigating apps is extremely complicated. Um, and so there's money left on the table and these families need cash. Um, and so I think that is a, um, a really, um, I think integrity is the word that comes to mind. We have all these programs that look great on paper, but I know the families that I work with are not accessing them because of the significant barriers. So I'd love to brainstorm and have conversations about that. And then the last thing are the gaps we know that are out there, like, Katrina mentioned, we know there are people that want mental health services, behavioral services, and aren't getting them. We know that there are children with anemia that can't get the iron medicine that they need. Um, 
And so how do we process that information just in this group? How can we really bring some of that up? It's not big policy issues usually. It's not, you know, 10 year plan type things. These are things that um, some of them we could, we could fix in a month. Um, so I'd love to have an opportunity to have some of that bubble up um, um, and address um, more quickly. Um, so those are just some things that have been on my mind. Oh, the last, I'm sorry, the, the very last thing is for us to understand is attack what tools we have. So I mentioned, for example, PIPs. Is this some, can we talk about recommending PIPs to the MCOs, um, things like that? Like what are our tools for action? I'd be really interested in understanding that better. So I, so I just want to answer one of the questions. I think um, Leslie and, and Angela know most of the, we, we have a CHW group. Two of us are funding within BPH our CHWs across the state, and we're expanding that network. Um, and we're also working with Commissioner Lee on the sustainability model for funding those community health workers after our grants go away. So I do think it would be nice to have a report to this group about that work. Um, and about what's being discussed as it relates to House Bill 525 and where we are with that. So um, I do think that's a great suggestion. Um, I, you also mentioned something, um, Julia, that I, that I meant to mention when we were talking about committee goals, and that's looking at our literacy, and looking at um, health literacy, and also looking at literacy in general for our, we have a fifth grade reading level in the state, fifth and sixth grade reading level, and none of the information that I see is at that reading level. So I think we need to be thinking about the literacy um, level of our communities and also universal design and how we present information. So um, just saying, I think that's a great um, sticky note as well. Um, and then you said something about TAC tools, if you can explain what you mean about that, Julia, really, maybe I'm not as familiar. No, I'm just wondering, um, I know that tax make recommendations to the MAC and then, you know, but what other tools do we have or techniques that we have to move ideas along, you know, for example, requiring a PIP. So say, for example, we wanted to talk more about doulas. Could there be an opportunity to, per, you know, encourage a, um, a PIP um, for maternal for doulas or something. So I'd, I'd love to know how do we suggest, how do we package what we, what our suggestions and ideas are as a tech so that they have move, movement. Um. Uh, this is Veronica, Judy Cecil with Medicaid. Um, you, so you would put it into a recommendation. Um, you know, this body does serve as an advisory. And so that would come up to Medicaid for us to take a look at the, um, as, as we explained in the first meeting, you know, this isn't this isn't technically part of the the MAC and TAC, and so um, the the recommendations don't have to go through the MAC. You all can those get submitted directly to us, and we'll consider those. I do want to um, request that you know this really is about us listening to you all out in the community who um, have a lot more um, experience and expertise in, in diversity and equity and, and addressing uh, inequities um, that, you know, we can, we can present to you all, but we really want to hear, you know, what is it specifically can we do? Um, you know, what, what kind of policies could we enact um, to, to improve um, the, the Medicaid program in addressing those disparities and equities. Um, we can't, we, we can't do everything. And, and I think we do need to make sure that um, we're uh, moving forward in a, in a, a way that is, um, I guess, realistic or um, manageable. <laughs> um, so, um, but it, it is, it is very important to us in Medicaid to understand um, more about what what are the barriers that you all see out there and potential recommendations around what can we do as a program to to try to address those. Um, and uh, so that you know, I'm just trying to. I want to make sure you all understand we're here to listen to you all. We don't want to be. We don't want to just 
uh, present to you. Um, we really want that engagement and, and recommendations um, that are actionable, you know, that we that we can take uh, to try to improve the program. Great. So, for example, the the list that I just gave are those the type of suggestions do you want, or do you want more big picture policy? So, you know, I, I guess um, I know you don't want to limit it, but can you give us even some more guidance on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I I think I think what would be helpful to us is to is to break those out, break those down and actually have conversations about, um, you know, for instance, the, the doula recommendation. And, and by the way, I mean, some of these are, are things that we are hearing in other tax, which is, is good, right? So there's some, there's some alignment and there's some common themes um, and recommendations that are coming out. Uh, and, and those, you know, that matters, uh, obviously, um, when there's such a, a demand for something. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I think it's, um, there are some states, there's, it, there's a handful of states that are covering doulas. Um, let's just, you know, I think, I think let's take these a couple at a time, as opposed to like putting them all on the next agenda. So we can have, I, I think what we want to have is in-depth conversations. Um, so that we can, that that'll help us. If, you know, if it's a, if it's like recommending doulas, it, it'll help us understand. Well, is if that's not something we can immediately do, is there some other barrier or you know some other way to address that? Um, I will tell you that we are monitoring. Some of the MCOs do cover that as part of their value added benefit. Um, and if we haven't sent that to you, we probably should. Is the is the grid about what those extra benefits are that come from the managed care organizations. Um, but what we're kind of doing is monitoring those to see their outcomes. Um, so uh, because that gives us that gives us the ability, it's kind of being piloted um, and we can see, you know, is there really um, an overall benefit to that for Kentucky, understanding that some of the states are covering it, um, you know, in their state plan. Uh, but those are some of the things, you know, I, I think let's make, you might want to prioritize some of the things you're interested in, and then let's, let's have those deep conversations um, about them. And then, you know, then you can kind of Girl said drive safely. maybe uh, work from that as a, an actual recommendation around it. That makes sense. <laughs> You all may have mentioned this already, but uh, I was wondering, do you all have a, um, a racial equity policy currently? We have a racial and health equity plan for Medicaid that aligns with our other sister agencies that aligns with the cabinet's pillars. Does that make sense? So we, we can share that with you. Okay, but that's, that's a plan, but not a policy. It's not a um, it's it's actually called it's a plan, and we just like we just started. Um, I think the language for us to really get or the drive for us to really get started on this was in, in 2020 from the secretary's office. So we've all kind of developed our own individual plans from each department, and then reported those out to ensure that they align with the cabinet. We while we want to be on the same page, right? So we've we've been doing the report outs, and um, that's why I said I had heard Miss Bibbs uh, give her report out, and they seem very similar to us in nature: public health and Medicaid serving the huge population. They sound very similar to us. Okay, thank you. So, Roger, we do have a health equity policy within BPH, um, but it's for the Department for Public Health only. So we're and we're part of this bigger picture and work within the cabinet. That the secretary of this initiative, he's moving forward with racial and health equity. So um, what we're looking at is now looking at our health equity policy and how we can use that racial lens on our policy within the EPA. So okay. Okay. okay, thanks. Mr. Cleveland, our first 
um, task delivery date is December the 31st and we want we've got a tool that we're trying to utilize that we want every division within our department um, and even smaller groups like the behavioral health initiatives within the commissioner's office so we've got two groups there um, we're all going to practice uh, using that tool and and get familiar with it so that we can start utilizing it every time a new program, new policy, anything like that. So we're just kind of beginning levels. That's really after our plan. Uh, Jody, if I've missed something, let me know. But after our plan was established and approved, that's really our first delivery, right? We've been working on uh, training and uh, knowledge about, about the tool and uh, Rashad from uh, Department of Behavioral Health has been working on that with us as well. And policy is being created and then implemented, integrated across the board as we go along. That's part of the process with this racial equity plan as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I asked is because uh, we're a few years behind you in public education, so we want to still beg and borrow whatever y'all have right now. <laughs> health, public health is ahead of us, uh, so that's one of the reasons. I, I've been selfish. That's the reason why I asked. Yeah, we've all been sharing resources that are good and that are approved up at a cabinet level. I, I've often reached out and um, gotten other language uh, from pol for policies and things like that that we know has been approved up to a cabinet level and and, and it's driving towards the same goal. So um, yeah, we we've been sharing a little bit back and forth, especially with our sister agencies that we work on a lot of initiatives with. So. Mr. Cleveland, if I come across anything that I think might be helpful to you as I'm doing research, I'll be happy to share. I appreciate it. Thank you. So should I jump in now as chair and move on to recommendations? Yes. Okay. So, um, so I think we have internal recommendations. I don't think we have any recommendations for the MAC right now, but um, so it seems like we have some follow up items. So the goal setting discussion with Vivian um, will get captured and um, that will obviously be an ongoing agenda item. We identified community health workers as a possible um, future agenda item um, to talk to bring them in and learn more about that work. Um, The for the list that I went through as far as um, prioritizing, I think between now and the next meeting, maybe we could get feedback on the fee schedule update and update on, or a feedback on the uh, dental, those two dental codes, not dental codes, surgical center codes. Maybe those would be the most low hanging fruit on that list. And then we can talk about um, others in the future. Um, on the MIC. I guess um, if people have ideas on who might um, serve on that, we'll get that email sent out with the minutes and it, it was in the it's in the chat for Carissa. What else? What else do we, do we need to make sure we get on the agenda for next time? Dr. Richardson, if you're um, interested in it, Jody and I thought we might bring forth the gear tool a short video and maybe just do some high level so you could see kind of the lens that we're looking through for the baseline looking at policies and contracts and things like that we could just do a high level if you want to and there's a little video to go along with it Great. do you want to plan on doing a deep dive into one of the um, um goal questions like maybe the um katrina on the um starting that conversation around mental health access. Yes, that's fine. So yeah, and just remember that that some of these goals and objectives are gonna take longer, right, than others. Um, oh, yeah. we, do, we do on the mental health side have probably an advantage that we've been addressing, um, strongly addressing mental health issues, especially during and after COVID. Of course, that's, that's a, um, a hot topic right now and need um so yes we can start on a, a conversation with that the data is probably going to take us a tad bit longer we've got i mean that's like 
you know, that's one of the things that we want the Medicaid, uh, Medicaid Innovation Collaborative to assist with is how do we get there and what do we do with it and um, who, do, you know, how we connect with the communities and pro providers and other partners. Great. Any other recommendations or questions for um, the Medicaid team that we want to talk about next time? I think maybe to think about streamlining, streamlining services. Um, you know, we hear a lot of times where people have to, it's just very hard for people to navigate um, Medicaid and you know where to go and who to go to and you have to go here and you got to understand your plan and so just oh you know how to really streamline that entire system to make it more <laughs> I know that's yeah you could do that <laughs> you know but I do know that that's an issue that we hear consistently um, from families is that it's, it's just difficult to navigate Great. Other things on people's minds? Um, the next item is the MAC meeting representation, um, which is November 17th. Um, I don't, I, I, as chair, I cannot attend the MAC. So someone else can attend the MAC. Um, so I don't know if Patricia can attend or if um, if you can't, if somebody else could block that time um, to get a feel for what the MAC is like so that when we present, you'll kind of give us advice on how to best um, make our recommendations to the MAC. And also to hear what they're talking about, what the other techs are talking about. I think I can attend if I get the link or the invitation for the meeting, I would appreciate it. And, and, you know, thinking about uh, what Dr. Cleveland and Vivian have mentioned about the racial um, policies and, and the low literacy that um, the whole state is having, um, something that comes to my mind again is that um, the lowest, uh, um, the lowest uh, percentage of uh, vaccinated schools are the ones that have the lowest scores for reading and math. So, and, and those are the schools that have the highest minorities, high, higher number of um, minorities that um, with kids that um, are eligible for reduced or free um, lunch, at least in, in Louisville. And so this, you know, all the social determinism of health go hand in hand, but I think vaccination can be upstream and we can do a lot of good things through that. Great. Yeah, vaccination is kind of like the canary in the coal mine. Um, certainly a, a signal of red flag when things aren't going, to, going well. Does the um, health department in Jefferson County go into the schools and, and do vaccination events? They don't. Okay. We have a great health department with very limited vaccination program. Okay. There are two clinics for vaccination. One, um, each clinic has one day and um, the vaccines are charged per in fair dose of vaccine. So gotcha. even if it's a scaled um, fee, um, it's still out of reach for so many families. I see. And then what about, um, I guess then do providers, are there any providers that are contracted with the schools maybe to come in and perform vaccinations? Does that happen? No, no, no. no. they are home, home providers, home um, medical providers, but out of the whole bunch um, that were for Medicaid, I, I cannot remember the number, but it was so low. Um, 67 providers for the thousands of kids that are uh, Medicaid, Medicaid eligible. Um, I have to check the numbers. I don't want to make it up, but 
Okay. Most of them will do physical exams, but will not provide vaccines. Okay, that's interesting. That's uh, that's what this conversation is important is, you know, to help us identify those um, issues. Thank you. JCPS does have a VFC contract, so they can administer themselves. However, um, you know, the, the practices that that see children but don't administer vaccine, it's because of the fee schedule. So they do administer vaccines to commercially insured children, but not to Medicaid children. Okay. So, and it's because of the fee schedule. So if they're so Julia, if they're a VFC provider and Just, they don't have, and, and they can choose or not choose depending on whether that client is a Medicaid client versus a um, private insurer, whether they so, give the whether they give that vaccine or not. So they're so in the school that they are VFC providers, so they give to everybody. Right. But in the community, if there so if there's a pediatric office that doesn't want to do VFC, but they still have Medicaid patients, they will send that patient elsewhere to get their vaccine because the the vaccine in their refrigerator is too expensive because Medicaid doesn't pay them enough for the vaccine. And so they it would be helpful to understand what that, you know, what it, what's the amount that um, providers are looking for. Um, sure, it's um, and and um, I don't. Is Stephanie Bates still with Medicaid? No, she's not. Okay. She was on top of this about whatever four years ago. So she, there are there are caught. There's like there's it's whatever it costs the the medication costs. So there's national numbers for that. Um, so that is an easy thing to drill down. It just needs to be updated up to what it actually costs. So and there, there's lots of resources to look for that. Julia, Judy has Dr. Judy has in here. Hello, Judy. Do you have a question? Hello. Uh, yes, I was um, just sitting here thinking because in the past, uh, if you were a Medicaid patient um, and eligible for VFC, the providers that were not VFC providers um, could not use one of those vaccines in their office. Um, but now with everything's changed, within the last couple of years it's changed and so now you can. Um, and I agree, I looked at the fee schedule earlier today. Some of the fees have been updated, those vaccination fees have been updated in 2022. Some haven't. Um, and I personally have no idea how much things actually cost, but um, but I, I wonder if there is an information gap out there that, that the providers just say, oh, I'm not a VFC provider, therefore I can't use my private stock. There, and that's part of the problem. I think that's a small part because I've worked individually with the pediatric practices here in town. And I've said, no, no, it's okay, you can give it. And they're like, we're not gonna give it because this vaccine costs $230 and you're only gonna pay me 150. So they know they can give it, but they're they're like, I'm not gonna do it. So mm -hmm. I think it there is some of both. And I think when we update the fee schedule, then we can re-educate um, practices about it. And we know it's a handful of practices. We're not talking, right. you know, mm -hmm. a huge number of, of practices, but it's a lot of kids um, that are in those practices not yeah. getting vaccinated. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. It was but Back in the day, <laughs> which wasn't that long ago, right, right. <laughs> but um, yes. Uh, just two comments. JCPS just became recently a BFC provider, and they are working on developing how to do the best distribution. They are short on, on the staff. They are short of. They are just implement. Uh, they are just starting. That's why it's still a big problem. And the other one is for BFC providers, they will get the vaccines, but I think the last uh, number that was shared that, I, that comes to mind was the reimbursement per vaccination is like $3. So they would say, no, nah, I won't do this. Well, the, the, va the, admi the administration fee is $3, but you, you get paid you know, the 250 or whatever it is for the actual vaccine. So there's different fees. So if you give, and you can get some of three dollars, some some fees are higher, and that doesn't count the actual reimbursement for the cost of the vaccine. Thank you. Um, we are right at time, so 
The next meeting is January 4th from 1 to 3, same time. And it's any, meeting same time. Any further discussion? It, I, I just have one, Julia. Is there anything you want this group to do before we meet again? So when we do meet, we can have more of a pointed conversation, kind of having the general discussion kind of again. I just want us to make sure that if there's one goal, if, if mental health is going to be that smarty goal that we think about, can we be having that as maybe some homework or maybe thinking about what that might look like when we come back together? Just so we, you know, we can definitely, too. I wanted to mention with that particular goal in the behavioral health area, we can definitely bring some information to you about what we're currently doing to increase access, if that would be helpful. Um, possibly put a PowerPoint together or something just to show you all, you know, kind of the things that we're doing right now ongoing to increase and improve access would be a good place to start. I think that statewide data too, someone had asked mm -hmm. statewide data that we can look at. It really shows, um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And then also, what what do you all know already that are problems that you're already working on in as much detail as possible? Sure. Yep. Yeah, anything else besides that kind of list we just went through for the next meeting with a definite focus on um, mental health and just everyone thinking about that and Dr. Richardson, again, on Jody and I pulled together a PowerPoint that we've been working on, and we can include some things that Dr. Terrio has also worked on, just um, increasing access and coverage and things like that in, this, in, in our populations. Um, again, our data, I don't know what we'll have right now. I can share with you what we've started seeing that we've that we've had to come up with uh, just recently uh, related to uh, some SMISED and SUD. Uh, substance use disorder information, but it's probably not exactly what you're looking at. But again, we've got to have a starting point, right? And I think the big picture to the data is going to be maybe a, a longer goal. I just wanted to share that with you. Great. And then anybody, you know, think about, talk to your friends and colleagues and patients and students or, and um, as many specific examples really um, help help dig deep into the issue when we can talk about that 15 year old who was just discharged from the hospital, who isn't able to connect and, or what, you know, just as detailed as possible, I think makes, makes the conversations um, more fruitful. All right, and then who's gonna check on the rotating chairmanship plan? Think yeah, I think Veronica is going to take that back and mm -hmm. see if it'll mesh with the uh, executive order and the bylaws. Right. I could just resign in three months and then <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Good and good then I'm sorry, Vivian. Yeah. I was saying it's been a good meeting, though. I'm, support, I'm glad we got. Maybe you'll forget to resign. Yeah. It's been a great meeting. <laughs> there you go. I'm looking forward to next time. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move, Elaine. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. 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 Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.